Good morning, everybody. I'm Philippe Dumas, the Secretary of EJEC. I hope you are all fine in this difficult period for everybody. But uh, here we would like to present you in, in this webinar a bit um, some interesting ideas how to invest in, in geothermal. Maybe you know that today should have been the event in in, in Frankfurt, the ITC event. event organized by uh, Enerchange, Jochen Schneider, in uh, cooperation also with Alex Richter from uh, Think Geoenergy, and EJEC is also uh, supporting the organization of this event. So uh, here we have a one-hour webinar. It will not replace this event because this event, Jochen will tell us more, is postponed to September, but we want to give you in one hour some ideas on what was expected to be presented during this, uh, this, this event on investment in, in geothermal. Um, after Joran presenting a bit the, the concept of this conference and what should have been the topic in this conference, I will present you briefly uh, the project GeoRisk, where we are. Uh, GeoRisk, it's a, it's a project supported by the European Commission, started nearly one year ago and we still have one year. It's about de-risking and uh, notably establishing risk mitigation scheme. Following that, I will give the floor to Thomas Garabetian will present you for the first time the market report 2019. We just finished to, to collect, but also to treat the data from last year. And you will see from Thomas some interesting news, notably regarding some special treatment we have done on, on, on the depths of the wells uh, drilled in Europe during the last years. And last but not least, we'll give the floor to Sanyev Kumar, of EJEC Head of Policy, he will give you a presentation on what is today the European framework in the financing, what it means this Green Deal, what is about this Green Deal. So from that, I'll, after this short introduction and presentation of the agenda, I will now give the floor to Joren Schneider for presenting a bit the IDC Invest Conference. So Joren, the floor is yours. Okay, Philippe, thank you very much for your introduction and also thank you very much for, for choosing this date where we planned the IGC Invest Geothermal Finance and Investment Forum in Frankfurt um, that we postponed just, just yes, one month ago as it appeared that uh, events will not be possible within the next month. Uh, we hope that we can manage uh, to have this event in September. We also thank um, the hotel, the Sofitel, that they supported uh, us and, and gave us the chance to have it on a Monday in September. And um, the, the second part will be on a Tuesday. So we changed a bit the agenda. We also thank our sponsors, um, which still stuck to the event and still support us. And so uh, it's easy for us uh, to continue with this event. On the next slide, uh, you will see uh, an overview uh, what we planned for this conference. Uh, so in our opinion, um, the, the major issues uh, for such an event uh, in, in Europe are on the one hand, the risk mitigation and also the risk mitigation schemes in, in different countries. And then also the investment opportunities in Europe here, we want to introduce several countries um, and their investment opportunities regarding geothermal. We focus, uh, focus on, on several topics on the geothermal areas in these countries, on the installed capacity, on the legal framework, on the funding schemes and the risk mitigation, and also the recent market development so uh, that every participant gets a very close focus on, on this country. Um, the evening will be a social event and on the next day we will have one workshop. So um, just have a look at the agenda on the next slide. We are in this lucky position that we are now very early ready with the program. Um, here we also thank EJEC uh, for their support. Uh, they will be in, in the welcome session with the European Green Deal what also Sanjeev will introduce within this session. And then we will have a risk mitigation where we look on, on the risk and the potential solutions. 
Therefore, uh, EJEC confirmed the ministry from Hungary uh, is, is still in discussion, but I think we are very close that they will confirm, the KFW confirmed to come, and there is also uh, an insurance broker which will join the event. The second part, we want to have the investor's perspective. Um, we are glad that we could invite uh, Dr. Albert Pohl from the Deutsche Erdwärme, who will give uh, their perspective, what are the risks they have to face and how they cope with. And then we invited several companies uh, which give answers how the risk might be mitigated. This is on the one hand, Dr. Christian Bauer from Watson Farley Williams. Uh, this is Pierre Hook from the drilling company. And I'm glad to announce that also, uh, now Pierre Hook from the TÜV, I'm, I'm sorry, he will speak about due, due diligence at the example of Garching and the, and the Alts, a German project, and we are also glad that a drilling company will join this session. On the afternoon, we will get into uh, several projects, as you see, yeah, the, the slide before. Um, we will have an overview about France. Uh, we will look at the crowdfunding um, of geothermal projects. We will have an overview about Germany. We will look at the geothermal district heating projects in Hamburg, which are presented by Hamburg Energy. We will have an overview about Switzerland. Here we are still waiting for a project, but Nico Lupi from the ministry already confirmed. We will look in the, in the last session of the afternoon on to the Netherlands, where Dago will be presenting. We are still in discussions with Croatia, Croatia, where Maya and Kripa from the Croatian Hydrocarbon Agency will give an overview about the country. And we're glad also to have Turkey in here with Jano Botskurt and also uh, with Ulush Karagas from Solu Energy. This will be the first day. Uh, we will have a social event uh, at the evening where all Participants are invited, and then we will start at the second day with an uh, overview. So you see this on the next slide about uh, the development in the Upper Rhine Valley. Here, um, the, the, the development of the project just started. We see here the Deutsche Erdwärme. We we see here also the ENBW, which have their the plan in Bruxelles. Um, we are glad also that Jean-Jacques Graff from, from France will come also on the second day. And we still look for further presentations regarding lithium, which, which is a big issue in the Upper Rhine Valley. And also uh, we would like to invite uh, Jörg Ude from, from Insheim. I think we will have good chances that he also might join. Uh, then we will have a finger food lunch and this would be the complete IGC Invest Geothermal Conference in September. So we would be glad if you can join. And um, we will be sure that we will have it on this date, uh, this event. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation, for the possibility to present by EJEC and looking forward for the other topics, uh, especially the market report and the Green Deal now it's coming up. Thank you, Yoren, for, for this uh, introduction. Indeed, it's a in, really interesting agenda, and uh, I hope many of you could uh, could uh, join this event, which is now in September. If uh, I look at uh, the agenda, um, I will uh, show now some results from, from GeoRisk. But before, I would like to explain a bit more how we will organize the session. So. Just for information, we are already more than 100 people attending this webinar. And uh, we need to be organized in terms of uh, exchange. So we will first give the presentation about the risk, then about the market report, and finally about the Green Deal. And after each session, there will be a five minute question and answer. It should be well organized. So you have two ways if you want to intervene. It's all you ask a question or you raise your hand by clicking 
on the, on the hand that you can see on, on the screen. And here, I will open you the floor, open your mic, unmute you, and you will be able to speak. Please be short and, and a clear question if you want to intervene orally. Okay, so with this short uh, clarification, I will now start to present you GeoRisk. So GeoRisk is a project uh, started uh, in October 2018, and the aim of GeoRisk is to look at this risk insurance mitigation scheme that do, do exist in Europe for, for, for many years, but only in a few countries. So where it's coming from, this GeoRisk project? It's coming from the fact that we know but in Europe, we have a large potential for developing geothermal heating, but it's a potential. We have also in Europe, a large potential for developing electricity, but it's only a potential because we know that for developing geothermal project, especially deep geothermal project, we have to overcome this IBC phase. You are all familiar with this graph, the objective of GeoRisk is not to work on this graph, is to work on another graph, this one. Because we have, after 20 to 30 years of experience in risk mitigation schemes in Europe, some lessons learned. And one lesson learned is that you need to have the right scheme for the right market. So it means it's not only to have a scheme, a risk mitigation scheme, but it should be the right scheme according to your market maturity. So that was a basic scheme we started with saying, okay, maybe when we have an immature market, we should be more with coverage with grants and becoming more and more mature, going to public private partnership and finally having some private risk insurance. So this is the idea of this project GeoRisk. GeoRisk will try to look at this market maturity for risk mitigation schemes, starting with some countries. We started, we start with countries having already a risk insurance scheme, France, Turkey, Switzerland, and Germany, with past experience, different scenarios, but each country having already a scheme, and we will see how they look at this market maturity and the transition in the, in the schemes they are proposing for project developers. And we look at also Hungary, Poland, and Greece, where we know there's a huge potential, there's no risk mitigation scheme, and we see that as a main barrier for the market development. So the objective is within the project to see the establishment of risk mitigation schemes in these countries. You can see a bit the coverage. The idea is to develop some tools for some key countries, but the objective is to replicate that in Europe and also outside Europe. You can see highlighted some key countries outside Europe, Kenya, Chile, Mexico, Canada. It's the countries we will work on for the next uh, 12 months, but the idea is as much as possible, the tools we develop will be also available for applications elsewhere in Africa, in South America, North America, and maybe we could look at other regions. What has been achieved until now? What has been achieved is the task and risk assessment. In the consortium, we have a lot of expertise about, about risk, de-risking, but we wanted to have a, a new picture, notably relatively um, updated and linked with market maturity. So we have done a risk register and I will show you how it looks like. We have done a risk matrix. So each risk has been ranked also. And we have developed that with a tool, which is an online tool for developers, that now you can look at. This tool, for your information, because it's the first call I would like to make, is the first version. And now we are in a consultation period, and we would like to receive, especially from project developers, some ideas, and some recommendations or some remarks about the tool we have developed. So this report, GeoRisk report is available on the GeoRisk website, 
uh, that it's easy to, to, to access. Um, and you can see different risk categories, different filters, uh, the online register, and the risk assessment result. I will not go too much into detail about what is the content of this tool, because for your information, we are about to organize a webinar end of April, especially on this Juris report. It was planned to have a physical public event during the World Geothermal Congress in Reykjavik end of April. This event is postponed, but we will anyway organize a webinar on Georisk. The second activity was to look at the framework for developing risk mitigation schemes. So we have an assessment and a comparison of a different risk mitigation scheme. The report is published. We have also a work on the framework conditions for establishing a new insurance scheme. And this work is also published. And recently, we have um, published our, our report on the condition for a transition in the insurance scheme. So you remember this first graph I show you from market maturity going from grants to convertible grants to public risk insurance and PPP. What are the conditions for such a transition? All this work is presented in a help desk. The help desk, so the Juris report, the target for developers, the help desk, the target group are more the authorities, the public authorities would like to be involved in risk mitigation schemes being already existing or want to establish a new scheme. So this help desk is, has been launched two months ago. It's just starting to be full by content. We will produce more reports in the near future and it will be much better later, but you still have some, some documentation and not every report I mentioned before. After being published this results, now we are in the phase of replication and dissemination of these results. So we look at, as I mentioned, first in Hungary, Poland, Greece, then in France, Germany, Switzerland, and Turkey, how we will be able to improve the current scheme or to uh, create new schemes. So this work will, will, will be done and, uh, and, uh, in, in the next 12 months. Uh, on top of that, there's an interesting work to be done on a financial model with a 10 years operation simulation. So this tool has just started, but if you're interested, feel free to, to come back to us. So we'll try to see what is also the, the budgetary constraint in, in establishing the tool and what is the operation in a 10 years perspective for the financial model. Last but not least, we have some activities, as I mentioned, outside the partners involved in Zurich, in Europe, especially in Denmark, Netherlands, Belgium, Croatia, Serbia and Slovenia, outside Europe, Chile, Kenya, Canada, Mexico, in top of that, Hungary is especially interested in that. We will look at at a regional, so a cross-country um, scheme covering different countries. And the example will be given for the Pioneer Basin, so covering all countries around Hungary. This is also an ongoing activity. The objective here will be to adapt the tools to create some liaison with decision makers, to develop some capacity building. We will organize workshops in these different countries or webinars. If you're interested, feel free to, to join these this events. We have a website where all this information is available. So with that, I will conclude my presentation. As I mentioned, I was quite short um, about the risk because we will have in one month from now, uh, normally it's planned the Wednesday 29th of April in the afternoon, a specific webinar on the risk. Thank you for your attention. I do not see any questions, so I will now give the floor to Thomas Carabetian for presenting so the first for the first time 
the market report 2019. So, Thomas, the floor is yours. <clears throat> yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, so, as Philippe just said, I'm going to, to present you um, uh, an overview of the results of the 2019 Geothermal Market Report. So the Geothermal Market Report is a publication that uh, uh, EJEC produces annually and that um, uh, gives an inventory of the geothermal installation for electricity, for district heating, and uh, produces some market data for the, uh, the conditions for shallow geothermal, so geothermal heat pumps. Uh, and it is a, a publication that is uh, destined to the, the members of EJEC. Um, so, first, some uh, some key figures uh, of the, the market report. So, what we have is about 130 geothermal uh, power plants uh, with. Uh, deployment that is fairly uh, stable and uh, especially driven by the Turkish market, which has uh, grown uh, very, very rapidly in the in the past few years, um, and for instance represents the bulk of the of the additions for the year 2019. Uh, for geothermal uh, district heating and cooling, uh, the EU now passed the two gigawatt thermal of uh, threshold for installed capacity. Uh, so this is a market that is, as you can see on the on the figure on the right of the of the slide. So the red representing the district heating and the blue the electricity. Um, district heating is much more widespread. We still some uh, important uh, disparity between uh, between countries. So Iceland obviously has a very large uh, uh, geothermal district heating uh, use, uh, but then you have other countries uh, such as France, uh, Germany that also make some. Uh, some fairly important use and that are rapidly uh, increasing the um, uh, deploying this technology. Sorry. Um, and then another uh, important threshold that was passed in uh, in the year 2019 in that uh, you know, in Europe there are more than uh, two million geothermal heat pumps that have been installed. Um, and uh, I will come back again to the the data in detail later. So for geothermal electricity in uh, 2019, uh, what we have had, as I just said, is a continued deployment in Turkey, which was driven by uh, a good policy framework that was uh, established a few years ago. Uh, so we had five plants that were commissioned in Turkey for a total capacity of 150 megawatts. Uh, then there was also one plant uh, commissioned in Germany, uh, which would start, I think, uh, or has started uh, uh, commercial production um, and then one plant in Iceland which uh, is not a new plant but is a retrofit of a, of a fairly old one uh, which was retrofitted and the capacity was increased by two megawatts so it used to be a three megawatt plant now it's a, a five megawatt um, power plant. So in the EU what we have observed is that uh, the market has been uh, slowed quite uh, quite a lot by uh, a stop and go and effects of uh, energy policies. So typically uh, setting up uh, uh, a given support framework and then announcing that it would change or that it would be discontinued without visibility on what would come next. And considering the very long development time of, uh, of geothermal electricity project, then it, uh, it really uh, hindered uh, development. Um, Overall, uh, there has been however, uh, a renewed interest uh, in deploying geothermal electricity in the year uh, 2019, uh, notably in the EU, um, notably because uh, geothermal uh, provides ele flexible uh, electricity production, it can also be used for cogeneration. And then we have uh, seen emerge uh, the topic of uh, mineral extraction from lithium brine, which had attracted quite a lot of, uh, of interest. Then another illustration of the um, of the lack of uh, of policy support to um, to geothermal uh, uh, electricity and the lack of uh, consistent policy focus is typically that in the EU, where member states have 
2020 objective uh, for the deployment of uh, renewable energy that is broken broken down into uh, some sectoral objective for various technologies, including geothermal power. Um, what we see that most countries are first very uh, far from achieving their, uh, their objective. Italy is at about 80%, but most of the capacity in Italy was installed or already planned when this objective was uh, adopted. Um, and Portugal, for instance, which is uh, the second highest, is only uh, a bit less than 40% of towards the completion of its objective. Um, then we have France, Germany, that are respectively at about 20 and, uh, and 12%. Um, that really show that not enough was done uh, in terms of providing the, the right amount of support and the, the right amount of, uh, of, uh, of planning. So Italian case, for instance, is a, is a good example where there's been no defined support framework for geothermal electricity for the last two years and a very long licensing process which has uh, really really slowed down uh, the, um, the obtention of, uh, of permits and the start of, uh, of new developments. Then um, I'm going to, to present uh, an overview of the data that uh, the eject market report was not collecting in the previous years we, so we are now starting to, to collect some data on the wealth of uh, just some installations uh, typically looking for geothermal power plants at the number of wells and uh, the depth. Um, so here, for instance, we can see that uh, there, there tend to be uh, much more wells uh, for uh, plants in high temperature countries, so typically Italy uh, and also Portugal, which is uh, uh, also somewhat volcanic uh, geothermal energy. Um, and that you have a fairly strong uh, correlation between number of wells and uh, the capacity, the electrical capacity that you can obtain from a given well. So typically, uh, you have a, a much lower power output from one geothermal well in France uh, than you do in Italy, where you have uh, higher temperature and higher temperature plant. Um, what this notably tells is that if we want to really scale up uh, geothermal electricity in a uh, lower temperature market, this will mean that there will be much more drilling needed uh, to develop the, the power plant than in, uh, in the high temperature ones. Um, another uh, interesting uh, data from the the wealth of geothermal power plants is that we can see a fairly large disparity between the, um, the depth uh, of wells, which notably reflect here the, the reinjection and the difference between reinjection and production wells. So for instance, France, you have a range that goes from 350 meters to uh, more than 5,000 meters, which also reflects two different reality. You have some uh, volcanic production in Guadeloupe and then you have uh, EGS projects in um, in, uh, in Alsace. Um, then regarding uh, turbine manufacturers, so um, what we are seeing is that uh, there's a consolidation of the leading suppliers, especially in the, in the Turkish market, so typically with, uh, uh, with Ormat or Atlas Copco. Um, Turboden also is consolidating its, uh, its position in the European market. Um, and what we have seen is uh, that with the Iceland, uh, Icelandic retrofit, uh, there's been a new entrant in the, in the geothermal uh, European geothermal market with uh, M&M uh, turbine technique, a uh, German manufacturer uh, that produced uh, a flash turbine for, for the Icelandic geothermal plant. Uh, moreover, there's a uh, continued dominance of the use of uh, binary system in Europe um, compared to, to flash, except for, again, the case of Iceland. Um, now for, for geothermal district heating and cooling. Um, in 2019, the market was especially driven again by the Netherlands, which have for uh, quite some years uh, representing, represented most of the uh, added capacity in the uh, European uh, geothermal district heating. Um, interestingly, Greece also has, uh, has been retrofitting uh, 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 
geothermal district heating system, increasing the, the capacity. Um, in Italy, there has been a renewed uh, use of, uh, of geothermal district heating in 2019. And then finally, quite a, an interesting uh, milestone is Spain, which uh, um, commissioned at the end of 2019, and I think uh, commercial operation will be starting in, uh, in the beginning of 2020, um, a geothermal district heating network based on uh, on the use of geothermal energy in a former coal mine. So uh, quite an interesting question because in Spain, again, there were uh, a lot of discussions to use more, uh, especially deep geothermal, but so far it has not been really translated in, uh, in many new developments. Um, then uh, this, uh, this figure here uh, represents the uh, geothermal district heating plants in operations and the plants that are uh, planned under extension or uh, under development. Uh, what we can see here is that France uh, continues to be the, the country with the largest number of geothermal uh, district heating system, with quite a few ongoing projects. However, we are also seeing that uh, Germany is looking to truly really, uh, increase its use of uh, geothermal district heating. Uh, the Netherlands uh, is likely to continue being uh, um, a driving market for the for the coming years, uh, notably driven by uh, a strong political support. Um, then the uh, Hungary and Italy, which uh, were, to be honest, developments have been a bit hindered by uh, uncertainties regarding uh, the regulatory framework and the permitting process, but a uh, recent signal may indicate uh, that this market will uh, actually deliver on, uh, on the, their, uh, their potential. And um, another interesting, uh, interesting market is again Poland, uh, which uh, where the government has directly invested into uh, quite a few uh, pilot projects which are now in development and uh, may lead to a quite a significant expansion of the use of, uh, of geothermal district heating in Poland and also the establishment of uh, a more robust industry. Uh, now again, uh, regarding the, the depth of the, of the geothermal uh, wells uh, in, uh, in, the, in some uh, European markets for, for geothermal district heating, here we see again this difference between um, High temperature markets such as Greece, to a lesser extent uh, Serbia, and uh, more lower temperature markets such as France, uh, Poland, uh, Denmark. There's uh, quite uh, an important difference in the, the depth where you have to go to uh, establish a district heating uh, system. However, in general, uh, I mean, projects have to go at around between. Uh, at least one to two and a half kilometers. Uh, so it's not quite as deep as for uh, geothermal uh, electricity. It's still uh, fairly significant. And uh, it's uh, quite consistent data, especially in, uh, again, in uh, lower temperature markets. Um, then uh, regarding the geothermal district heating market dynamic, as you can see on this curve, uh, the past eight years have been uh, quite uh, erratic. Um, however, uh, despite uh, 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 despite this uh, this strong uh, difference from one year to another uh, between 2012 and uh, 2016 or even 2017, what we have seen in the past three years is that there's been uh, stabilization in the market, uh, notably driven by a few key markets such as the Netherlands, uh, but also to a lesser extent France and Germany. Um, and uh, now we are expecting a fairly rapid acceleration in new developments because there's quite a, an important project pipeline uh, and especially a fairly diverse project pipeline so all over Europe uh, with many projects that have been started already a few years ago and that we are looking uh, to come online in the, in the coming years. Um, however, what this uh, this, uh, let's say, uncertainty in the market and this lack of very sustained uh, and obvious growth in uh, the number of commissioning of projects uh, illustrates if there's a lack of uh, robust and consistent policy framework for geothermal district heating. So, uh, again, coming to the EU objective for 2020, uh, most of them are still quite far uh, on their 
National Renewable Energy Action Plan objectives. Uh, Austria is the closest to its objective, but it's still only at 60% of, uh, of the completion. Um, then uh, what we're seeing also is like, is that including the countries with uh, an important uh, target, such as France and uh, Germany, or even the Netherlands, which right now is one of the, of the best practice country, uh, they are below 40%, or even for the case of Germany, below 20% of their uh, uh, as a objective of deployment. So this is really a consequence of, uh, again, the stop and go effect of uh, uncertainty in the policies. So uh, no long-term clarity about uh, the framework, many changes uh, that are being announced and that uh, are not encouraging uh, investors to develop new projects. There's clearly a need for uh, an adequate uh, policy framework for uh, a successful market uptake of uh, geothermal district heating. And here we can take the, the best practices of some markets such as uh, the Netherlands or even to, to some extent France um, in what works to enable the, the deployment of systems. But these good practices need to be again scaled up to really uh, bring the, the geothermal market to its, uh, its potential. Now coming to, to the last part of this, uh, of this presentation, geothermal heat pumps. Um, so, as I said in the introduction, uh, we have now uh, passed uh, the uh, 2 million geothermal heat pumps uh, uh, in Europe. Um, again, the structure of the leading markets for, the, for shallow geothermal has not really changed a lot. Uh, Sweden remains the largest market in terms of installed stock of, uh, of geothermal heat pumps and as well uh, to some extent in terms of use. Uh, Germany, uh, the market has uh, increased uh, over the past few years or has at least stabilized at a, a fairly uh, uh, it's a higher level than uh, what it was a few years ago. Uh, so deployments are quite all right. Then we have the French market which was very good, uh, very dynamic a, a few years ago but that is now uh, fairly uh, fairly slow with uh, uh, about 3,000 units sold uh, every year. Um, and again, we still have some markets which are emerging, but where deployment are quite rapid. Uh, so here we have Poland, uh, the Netherlands or, or Belgium, which has a, a very important growth of the installed stock year on year. So uh, we are seeing changes coming up. Uh, but so far, it, uh, it remains uh, a bit of the same picture. Um, again, for, for shallow geothermal, uh, what we have seen is that mostly uh, member states have not delivered on the objectives they have set themselves for uh, 2020 uh, in terms of installing geothermal uh, heat pump. However, the case of Sweden is a very good example that um, it is possible to have a strong market penetration of geothermal heat pumps. In Sweden right now, uh, this technology is mainstream, especially for new building or, or deep renovation. Um, and it's widely, uh, widely commercial. Uh, and then we have the case of Germany where uh, so the, the market is not quite to the 2020 objective, but it's not so far from being on track. So it can also be done in a fairly large uh, in a fairly large um, economy, uh, which then highlight the fact that, for instance, in, in France, you really had this very strong impact of, uh, of uh, changes in the policy framework that uh, had an adverse, uh, adverse effect on, on your deployment and, uh, and really shows uh, bad practices that should not be replicated and underlines the importance of uh, having the right policies and when changing these policies because obviously the technology becomes more market mature to do that in a way that is uh, uh, let's say mean tested and replicates best practices such as was done for instance in, uh, in Sweden. So thank you for your attention and if there are any questions. Yes Thomas we have one and raised from Isaac Inatio Gonzalez from NG. So I unmute you and the floor is yours. 
Isaac. Okay, thank you very Isaac. much. Um, excellent presentation. I was just, uh, well, the, the, the question is, you mentioned the uh, generation of uh, electricity with a specific um, uh, you know, uh, binary cycle of flash technology, but I couldn't get the name of the company that was developing the Okay, so I think uh, it was a my... German company, but uh, I would like to know about these uh, uh, developments and the potential that they may have. So it's a uh... well. Uh, to be honest, I I don't have uh, a lot of data on this uh, on this company. Um, it is so here we have the the list of the uh, turbine manufacturer that uh, can you still see my screen. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I think it was M and M. Um, yes. Yeah. So M and M Turbitechnic uh, here in red. So in red we have the the new turbine that were commissioned uh, in uh, in 2019. So um, M and M Turbitechnic uh, they manufacture a steam turbine. So for geothermal it's a it's a flash turbine I think that they produce. Um, they do not manufacture uh, binary, so far as I can tell, or at least it's not what they produced for uh, the Icelandic plant, because in Iceland they directly extract uh, uh, steam, uh, basically. Uh, so they do not need mostly to to deploy a binary system as we do in continental Europe, uh, or as they do in uh, in Turkey as well. Before uh, for uh, not to be also to mitigate the issue of uh, of non condensable gases. Uh, so Perfect. yes, so this is I think uh, um, a fairly small German uh, company. I think it's an SME, uh, and mostly they are active in the uh, biomass or, or biogas uh, space. May, may I add something? This is um, they are working together with the Green Energy Group. Uh, I think it, it's a Norwegian or, or a British company, and uh, they manufacture a turbine for a flash plant in the uh, in the Grafla field in in Iceland. Perfect. It was a sort of guided uh, question uh, to ask you: What do you see as potential for uh, generation of uh, electricity? With low temperatures, some uh, collaboration of European, some European countries are collaborating with uh, other uh, countries from the world, from not Europe, like Mexico or Indonesia, to develop uh, electricity through low temperature. What are your expectations in, in, in these developments? Not only for international, but only for you for Europe as well. Well, mostly Europe uh, focused. What are your pers perspective, your idea in terms of generation uh, of electricity with these advanced uh, turbine manufacturers for the next coming ten years, five years? Too much. Um, I can so give. I, I can take Europe, a few uh, Yeah. So as it was highlighted already by, by Thomas in, in, in the graph on, on turbine manufacture, um, already the trends exist for, for, for 10 years that the binary turbines are dominating the market in Europe. Um, traditionally in low to medium temperature fields, but also no uh, more and more in high temperature fields due to different constraints, technical constraints, environmental constraints, etc. Due to the fact that in some countries you need to develop business models of combined heat and power production, it will be a trend in the future. What we know is that you have a technical limitation in lowering the temperature, um, so this will be a constraint, um, but uh, probably what has to be looked at, um, and in the report is not yet uh, pictured and shown, is that we, for the moment, look at a typical demand side, electricity for the grid, heating, district heating for building. In the future, we have to open the door to new schemes in agro-food industry, we see already in Netherlands, but for the industrial applications. 
chemical industry, over industries, where we will need to provide them electricity, heating and cooling, with the advantage geothermal of being base load and more and more being flexible. So all that, it's ongoing technological trend. We see in Europe, we see it globally, and we try to picture that in the market report, but the market report is only a picture of one year. It will be interesting to look at indeed in, in a perspective of five to six years. I thank okay. you, Isaac, for thank this you. interaction. We need not to go to the to the last presentation, but thank you, Isaac, yeah. for your interesting thank questions. You. Also, a really interesting questions in 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 the chat, so I will try to answer to them. I will now give the floor to Sonyev. Thank you, Philippe. For the um, last I presentation, hope. which is about the European framework, so I Excellent. make you presenter, and you're able to show your presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Philippe. Um, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to talk to you for the very first time, and I'm looking forward to um, uh, meeting you in person when we uh, when we meet again in uh, Frankfurt later on this year. Um, all things being uh, um, all things being wonderful. So um, uh, let me move into what is the the European dynamic, um, the the policy dynamic. Oops, excuse me. Yep. Um, sorry. You're just going to see a little bit of my screen. Let me just quickly get rid of this. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to discuss, uh, I'm going to cover four points, but I, I think it's absolutely essential that, to, to recognize there's a, there's a clear link between the market report that, that, that Thomas has just presented and actually the last comments that Philippe just made. <coughs> a lot of the market is driven by policy certainty. We've had a reasonable framework up until 2020. A 2030 framework was kind of patched together. It's clearly inadequate, um, and a lot of the changes that, and a lot of events have kind of crept into um, a policy, such as the coronavirus, such as um, a few other activities, which have meant that there's a degree of uncertainty. Now, whenever there's uncertainty, there's a tendency to kind of hold back in terms of investments and you know explorations. But at the same time, there's an opportunity, and and really, there are there are a lot of opportunities hardwired now into at least the EU's framework. But we're also seeing lots of other countries looking at stimulus packages, and there's opportunities for geothermal, and the geothermal decade really taking off over the next uh, couple of years. So let me start off firstly with the the biggest source of finance, uh, the most important uh, part of the EU, which is the multi-annual financial framework, <coughs> or MFF for short and the, the EU Green Deal. Just for your reference, uh, a lot of the, some of the projects that have been mentioned uh, by Philippe, um, the GRS, the GOMV, a whole host of others, have been funded through the multi-annual financial frameworks and research um, activities. That budget is coming to an end this year, and there's a proposal on the table to look at how big or how small the budget should be um, for the next seven years, starting from 2021 onwards. Now, of course, there's a couple of problems that we have, as I've just mentioned. We, unfortunately, uh, Brexit is becoming closer to a reality, which means there's a nine billion gap um, uh, in the budget proposal. We know that there's a recession that's going to be happening because of the, the, the unfortunate pandemic at the moment. But, and this is really important, we now know that lots of governments are going to start pumping money back into their economy and are looking at ways in which you can maintain and increase employment. Um, and these kind of green stimulus are going to be a huge crest and hopefully geothermal can, can jump on the back of that. Um, one of the key drivers in the EU is going to be the Green Deal. Um, this, is, this is kind of hardwired into... The, the senior positions within the Commission. So we, we know that this is going to be a priority, it's going to remain a priority, um, and we know that a lot of political capital is going to be spent on this. So we have a degree of certainty in the direction of travel. Um, these are kind of various elements within um, um, the, the Green Deal. I'm really going to focus on the, the bottom uh, left-hand corner, the financing into transition, because a lot of this is not just about the orientation, which direction we're going, targets we want to achieve, but, but more importantly, how do we concretely build that enabling capacity to make sure we reach those targets. Um, so from our perspective, the most important uh, 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 discussion at the moment is around changing the 2030 targets. You'll recall that the, the 2030 target uh, as a greenhouse gas target, um, and it's to deliver a minus 40% reduction. 
Now, from the geothermal community's perspective, the, most, the two most important sub-targets that make up this 40% are the 32% um, renewable energy um, target and the 32.5% uh, 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 energy efficiency targets, both of which have impacts in different sectors, buildings or um, uh, electricity and heat. Uh, but, in, but importantly, those now are up for revision um, again. So, and a lot of this depends on whether we have a minus 50% target for 2030 or a minus 55% target. Obviously, as EJEC, we are asking for the minus 55% target because it's the most consistent with the climate, uh, the impact of climate change, the need to address that. But also, it's, it's the most important in terms of the real potentials that geothermal and other forms of kind of renewable energies combined with energy efficiency and circularity within the economy can actually deliver so this is a this is a sensible target to go for it's the right target to go for and a lot of momentum has been is being built up around that now importantly for the community and this is where the policy certainty comes from there will be a discussion around heat um, and certainly EJEC has been one of the, the most prominent voices in putting heat further and further up the, the political agenda um, so that we have a, a conversation around, you know, 50%, nearly 50% of our energy consumption, which is largely forgotten by policymakers. So this is, this is an important thing. We're not saying let's not, let's take our foot off the pedal of electricity. What we're saying is, is let's put both pedals electricity and heat on at the same time to the floor. So we max out everything we possibly can. Um, within that, um, there are going to be a couple of uh, uh, opportunities um, for geothermal. Um, for example, Horizon Europe, which is a new research um, uh, um, uh, framework going up until 2027, is gonna have a mission orientated types of research. And they've kind of identified a couple of key themes, one of which is cities. So when Thomas was talking about district heating systems and they're likely to take off in the pipeline already, we would start to expect to see a lot more um, district heating pressure coming on as we start to see the, a focus upon how do you decarbonize cities, what is the research needs, but also what are the renewable and innovative technologies that can be applied to, to help deliver those uh, uh, commitments. So this is a really big opportunity um, on the horizon. I'm going to cover the Innovation Fund in the latest slide, but it's important to highlight it here because this, is, again, is an important part of the, the driver for geothermal. There's also something called the Trans-European Energy Networks. You may have heard some of the press around projects of common interest and the amount of uh, subsidies that have gone into particular fossil um, solutions. There's now a clear recognition within the EU machinery that this has to be broadened out to look at district heating systems, but heat in general. And again, this is a this should be a huge um, um, uh, avenue uh, for future geothermal growth. Particularly, if a project is recognised as a um, a project of common interest, then they get 50% funding from the EU budget. So again, it dramatically brings down the cost of um, a project and is a huge opportunity. And just finally. As Philippe mentioned, you know, it, it, kind of conventional thinking has always been to, to view uh, this as a conversation around, you know, district heats, heat pumps um, and electricity. And actually what we're finding now is, is that with geothermal lithium and the fact that um, EDGIC became a member of the, the, the European Battery Alliance, that the whole story around lithium is adding an additional feather to the cap of um, geothermal projects. And a lot of interest is now uh, are coming in our direction because of this new lucrative opportunity that can come out. And clearly the, the, the linkage between different sectors in kind of policy jargon, we call this sectoral integration, putting um, uh, 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 renewable heat into, um, uh, you know, increasing the role for renewable heat, but also linking buildings, electricity, heat, all together so that you, you, you maximize the, the potential for um, uh, replacing the existing fossil capacity with renewables um, is becoming the, the, the major opportunity. So moving on from the, the, the kind of the, the Green Deal overview, um, there's a big opportunity on the horizon in June. And the way in which I've done this presentation is, is I've, I've kind of laid out the opportunities in terms of how close they are to call 
materializing. So we expect to call around the horizon 2020, that's the existing research framework, for a billion euros at least. Um, and the focus of this is to um, factor in um, demonstration projects, uh, which deliver not just on the Green Deal, but also where possible industrial strategy, where possible heating um, and, and many other activities. So this is this is going to be big. Um, we will be putting information about this on our members um, uh, sections of our website and certainly encouraging our members to be looking a lot more uh, focused there. So um, please do keep an eye out for the news round and the newsletters. Um, and if you're not a member just and you're interested in projects, then um, you know that it's, it's going to be very, very lucrative to sign up. Um, uh, as soon as possible. Um, so that's the that's the demonstration funding. Now, on top of that, we have the innovation fund. The crucial thing about the innovation fund is is that unlike the multi-annual financial framework, this is all financed by the European's carbon market, the emissions trading system. So this has a life of its own. Importantly, this has a financial stream of its own. So whilst we're going to have big politics trying to sort out how much money collectively the EU should have, the EU ETS will continue to churn away and it will continue to, 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 to give vast quantities of carbon revenue into each uh, European member state. And this is, really, this is why the Innovation Fund is a very lucrative opportunity and something that you know, we encourage all of our members who are looking at innovative um, uh, geothermal projects to, to certainly be looking at. Um, we know the first call under this new fund is, is scheduled for around June this year. So again, you have time to start preparing. We expect uh, the, the fund may be 10 billion, but, a bit, but of course, because it's linked to the carbon price and the, the price of uh, EU ETS allowances has shrunk from uh, 20, nearly 25 euros down to 17 euros, the size is going to get smaller, but we expect this to rebound because as I mentioned earlier, um, there's so many policy initiatives which are in the play, which means that you're going to have a change to not only the renewable and energy efficiency targets, but also the ETS. That will almost definitely get stronger. So again, we expect price to rebound and actually to be you know, possibly even bigger. Um, so this innovation fund, there are kind of four uh features that it looks at there's there's really three which are most relevant for geothermal so the first one obviously is is its contribution as a renewable energy how do you start to max out more innovative ways in which you can um uh, produce um uh, geothermal energy there's also um energy storage and the the, the opportunities for uh, underground thermal storage again as a possible project um uh really th this is this is a um this should be a, a really good avenue for that kind of thinking and as i as i mentioned earlier with energy intensive industries and the need to help industry by energy intensive industries i mean cement steel paper and pulp chemicals etc cetera, etc cetera, um there's a, there's a greater focus on solving their problems and if geothermal can fit in to solve some of their um, unique process emissions, for example, the chemical sector, a lot of their emissions are actually uh, 50 to 70 uh, degrees Celsius. So well within the range of geothermal space. Um, in the paper sector, we've mapped the uh, paper and pulp, uh, sorry, sector, we, we've mapped the, again, the, the temperature range is well within the low to medium geothermal space. So there's a real opportunity to find synergies, not just in terms of primarily producing heat or electricity, but also linking that into specific demands for industry. This is a huge new market and it's one that we need to find ways to, to maximize. Um, in terms of the um, application, there are a couple of things to, to, to keep your eyes on. As I've mentioned, we expect the first call to be in June um, of this year, and then we expect regular calls um, from from uh, 2020 onwards. So, sorry, yes, from this year onwards. So, again, th you know, there's a chance if you don't fit into the first call to at least make sure that you have an opportunity for your project to fit into a future call. Um, the, the one of the key things that's that's important in this um, in these kind of projects is is to make sure you have the support or the endorsement of a member state. So um, when you're developing your projects, now is the time to also, if you have an opportunity to reach out to a, a government ministry, to at least bring them into your uh, thinking and, 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 and give them the opportunity to, to get increased revenue from the EU um, into their country via, via the Innovation Fund 
uh, and a project that you're, you're putting forward to them. So again, real opportunities here, and, and we, we we're hoping um, as many geothermal projects are are signed off. Um, and of course, uh, you know the colleagues in the policy and team and, and across the EDGEC uh, world are happy to, to to help and act as a sounding board. Um, this is the this is the kind of shape of financing that's available. So one of the most important changes to the innovation fund from its uh, predecessor, the NER 300, was this uh, the upfront payment um, and the, the the initial granting um, of finance um, up to 40% um, of the total uh, uh, project at the start. So again, this makes it much easier when you have large upfront capex co capex costs. Um, to start to bring that cost curve down, and this is this is really really uh, very very important. Um, there is an issue that it's this is all post feasibility, so um, and we're trying to work out ways in which we could perhaps move that uh, our grant award back to the feasibility stage. But you know it's worthwhile recognising that in another piece of EU legislation, uh, the Connecting Europe facility, which is part of the 10E that I mentioned in an earlier slide, you do have the opportunity to get financing from the EU for um, feasibility studies, scoping studies, and mapping. And you know it's one of the things that I think collectively as a community we need to work to make sure we maximise that, that opportunity. Okay, um, moving on very swiftly to the, the, the final fund, um, which is the modernization fund. Like the innovation fund, this is linked to the ETS. So again, it's outside the multi-annual financial framework. Um, but what's really important about this is, is that we are we are talking about substantial sums of money for actual deployment of uh, projects on the ground. So um, we have a, a, a huge opportunity um, to, to really start to move in a couple of the, the countries that, if you look at one of Thomas's earlier graphs, were starting to sprout in terms of domestic uh, 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 domestic heating systems. Um, the modernization fund uh, is linked to 10 Eastern European member states from Bulgaria down to Slovakia. The list of them is on the next slide. Importantly, um, uh, there's a focus on generation uh, of heat and electricity from renewables, which is very important for us, but also sectoral coverage. So wherever there's a link to transport, buildings, agriculture. So for example, if there's a possibility of geothermal lithium being applied to a geothermal project, then that starts to tick two boxes and it makes the project that much more favorable. Um, modernization of existing networks, they clearly uh, highlight their district heating uh, system. So again, this is a huge, uh, huge opportunity for the geothermal community to, to jump on um, as quickly as they can. This is the distribution of allowances. The volume of allowances was a political decision. We can't change that. The only thing that's going to change is roughly how much money does each government have, um, ranging from whatever the carbon price is going to be. So as you can see, the carbon price today is at 17 euros, so it's kind of halfway in between the two. This is still substantial sums of new finance coming into countries. Um, this is the structure and the application process around the modernization fund. I'm running out of time, so I, I, I can't go through this detail by detail. The crucial thing is, is that the fund is managed by the European Investment Bank, um, and they will be looking to uh, unlock additional funds from the Invest EU program into the modernization fund. So this is big, and it could get bigger. Um, so we really, we're really hoping to, to, to see growth, and we should see this in a couple of years' time, I'm sure, when Thomas does the, the market report for 2023, we'll see the modernization fund really kicking into some of those Eastern European countries, provided we in our community are able to maximize this opportunity. So on that note, um, uh, I just want to leave you with three um, uh, key points. The first key point is the, you know, the geothermal decade is starting off with a focus on policy certainty. Two, there is financial streams that are available now, um, and we have to be organized to make sure that we, we get our projects signed off. But three, the future actually looks bright, um, but its brightness depends on how well we maximize the existing opportunities from the financial streams. On that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Sana Eliev, and i just keep you one more minute because we have one question for you. Oh, okay. How confident are you in inserting geothermal energy in the 10E? That's How a really confident good are you? 
<laughs> I'm very confident, actually. I think I think a lot has changed. Um, and let me let me qualify why I think I'm very confident. Um, there was a lot of political pushback around the the fourth uh, project of the common interest list, the, the fourth PCI list, which was just signed off by the Parliament a few months ago. The the Commission was backtracking. Um, the Parliament is backtracking. Now, we've been talking to people within the Commission, within the Parliament, and everyone is hungry to look at, you know, renewable energy systems within it. And we've had a lot of support from MEPs who are going to be key decision makers in this process, as well as parts of the Commission who are saying, OK, what does geothermal, how does geothermal look like? What parts of TENI does it fit into? And what do we need to change to get to where we need to be to really allow this to fully cover um, geothermal? So um, myself and my team are working on a series of policy recommendations. We're going to have a dialogue about this, but I'm very confident that there's going to be a lot more coverage for geothermal. So yes, I, I, I could bet my house on that one. Thank you very much, Sonia, for this optimism. I thank you, all of you, for having attended this webinar. I hope you have enjoyed it, as I have enjoyed, because also for me, it was the first time I have seen the, the market report from 2020. We were more than 100 people, so we see it was really interesting. Ah, just one question. I, 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 we can say the last one. So, Hieronimo, Carcelen, you raise your hand, so I open you the floor for the last, last question. The floor is yours, but you're self-muted. Yeah, you can speak now. Jeronimo, the floor is yours. But we cannot hear you. From Chile. It seems we have a technical problem. We cannot hear you, but Jana Tronco wants to speak. So, Jana, I will give you the floor. You're self muted, Jana. Good morning. No, you can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, good morning. My question is if you consider that the current and um, extremely low price of oil will diminish the progress. Um, of the geothermal development so far and also the financial support of uh, of the governments in Europe. Sanjev, I let you answer that. Thank you. I, that's a, that's again that's a really good good question and it's the kind of thing that requires a, a long answer. Um, the short run answer is is that you're you're going to see. Um, there, there are two drivers uh, for change. So yes, um, oil, the, the low oil prices will have an impact. But at the same time, if we start to lock in our policy direction and the policy orientation, then what you're going to find is as gradually our discussion moves away from changing products. I, I, I don't know how familiar everybody on the call is with um, the, the internal market. This is this, There's one aspect of the, the European internal market, which is really quite important, which is the ability to set product standards. Now, one of the things I didn't cover in the Green Deal conversation, but it's pertinent to what's happening in the industrial policy discussion, is the need to, is the is the focus on actually shifting the definition of a ton of carbon free or green steel, um, and they're defining how much CO2 content that steel would have, and then therefore only that. Only steel with that level of CO2 content will be allowed to be traded across the EU. Now, I think what you're going to find is, is that there's going to be ways in which we de-link um, uh, projects from um, uh, uh, from, fi um, from uh, oil prices, from gas prices, um, and so on and so forth. And I think the, the interesting marker to that is to actually look at the carbon price. So again, um, you know, when the financial, when the global economy started to dip last last week, the price of carbon went from 25 euros down to 15 euros. And over the last two days, it's bounced back up to euros. And I think what you're seeing there is, is that there's a clear recognition in the policy world that carbon has a limited role to play. And therefore, anything, you know, the projects that would offset um, uh, carbon um, and fossil based uh, um, energy sources is actually going to increase and have a life of its own. So I think you're going to see that de the de de linking um, later on. But look, this is a longer, this is a longer, I can give you a longer answer to this one. So what I will do is, is I'll pick it up by email afterwards. And any other question that's directed towards me, I'm happy. My email address is available, happy to, to pick those up myself or with my team. And we can 
you know we can we can be as precise as possible but i hope that's given you a flavor of the direction of travel thank, thank you, you very much so we have Jeroni Mokassen trying with another connection to connect. So I unmute you. You are able to speak yourself muted. It's your last chance to speak from Chile. Yes, the floor is yours. This is Jeroni Mokassen from the Geopolitical Association in Chile. Thank you for the presentation. It's very, very interesting and I'm very aligned with what's happening here in that country. Uh, my question uh, if this farms we heard only apply to to european countries or could also apply to european investment in other jurisdictions um philippe i can i can respond to that one um uh, firstly thank you for your call and thank you for your question um uh, there are specific pots that are put aside for um, what is called the external action services. So this is the, the EU's kind of diplomatic arm. Um, now, for example, there's a specific, in the last uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework, there's five million set aside for advancing climate and energy policy from the EU to China. So a lot of China's carbon market was built up through a lot of expertise coming in um and, and actually developing on the ground uh policy architecture but also project financing systems uh within china all funded by the eu there's a there, there should be a, a separate pot for the the latin america and there's a separate pot for the eu africa um so again all of these have an energy element within them um and it's really a case of who shouts the loudest and who gets there first so again i can find out for you where the latest thinking is on the eu latin america um uh, relationship there's almost always financial uh, 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 availability there already um so so you know the, the ability to do kind of uh, collaborative projects especially in kind of uh, renewable energy uh, solutions is is the kind of thing that eu wants to project itself out so I, there should be something, I can't tell you precisely how much it is or whether that's going to exist in 2021 after the MFF discussions, that will come to, but I can certainly find out and look for you. I mean, what we do know, for example, though, is there is going to be a clear funding line for the neighbourhood countries. So um, these are the likes of Ukraine, Belarus, um, um, uh, the Western Balkan countries who are kind of on the verge of or considering this joining the EU, um, they've already been asked to align their energy and climate policies to the EU's climate and energy policy. And there's always finance for specific projects to kind of boost that capacity up. So it could be from an actual uh, project on the ground to the capacity building to, you know, create a system to um, uh, create a legal architecture to allow geothermal to, to, to drive in those countries. So that's the kind of thing that can be replicated all over the place. Um, and as another issue, I'm sure you're, you you may be working with my colleague Thomas on the, the GMX uh, project, which is, you know, the, the next stage is to start thinking about how do we focus on export credit agencies. There's a, there's a very live discussion going on in Europe around that one. And again, that's all linked about how we move technologies and investments outside the the confines of the eu so yes there's there's going to be an opportunity one way or another but specifically every single foreign office department certainly the the german and the uk ones in particular have project financing for clean energies um so giz is the german finance uh, uh used to be the uk foreign office this was before brexit uh, but again they would organize a lot of kind of capacity building, obviously to promote their own technologies, but to build that capacity within those countries as well. So there is there is funding available at EU level, but also within you know national governments. We just need to find out where it is. Thank you, Sanyev. And uh, just to complete this information, as I mentioned earlier, in GeoRisk, we are covering Chile, and we plan a webinar specific on Chile. In top of that, we'll have a session at GeoRisk in Bogota, uh, postpone also to September. So uh, we will try doing this event for Chile and for South America to come back with, with more details. Okay. No, I think it's time to come back to the agenda and it's the end of this webinar. I know that other people wanted to intervene and we'll ask them to come back to us via, via email and we'll try to, to, to reply to them and to tweet this information. I want to thank the participants we were more than 100 people joining this webinar, so I hope it was really interesting and useful for you.
I want to thank the panelists, Sandiev, Thomas, my colleagues, but also Joren for the interchange. I hope it was interesting to learn about all this presentation and give you both the interest to join this event organized by Joren and Alex in, in Frankfurt in September. I hope also you enjoy the work done by EJEC. I remind all members that we have a specific webinars for you next week to present you in details all the fun presented by Saniev. Now it's time for me to close this webinar. I hope you will have a good end of the day. We are all in the mood of teleworking, we, but it's not preventing us of developing some interesting um, tools with webinar and interesting ideas on financing. As a Jack, we'll develop an, an, a series of webinars in the near future because as it's mentioned in my, in my screen, we are in 2020, but the next decade will be geothermal. Thank you all and have a good day. Goodbye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye.